and welcome to Bog Tales. On behalf of all of our storytellers this evening, we're delighted to have you join us for this exciting event. So my name's Sarah and I have the pleasure to work for the International Union for the Conservation of Nature's UK Peatland Programme, promoting peatlands and all their benefits, and I'll be your host this evening. So before we begin, I have a few housekeeping bits and bobs. So this event is all about stories, but there'll be an opportunity to ask our guests questions after the story section has finished, either about their stories, their work, or your peatland questions, if anything comes up. So please feel free to add anything that um, springs to mind in the Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom screen, and we'll put it to our panelists at the end. Any problems, you can ask, um, any problems, you can ask for help, and we have the wonderful Hannah available to deal with any problems. So please use the chat function to contact Hannah and she'll do her very best to help. This whole session will be recorded and made available on Sage's YouTube channel after the event, so you're able to revisit it. So this event is hosted by Sage's, so the Scottish Alliance for Geoscience, Environment and Society. So Sage is a pool of researchers from institutions all across Scotland, working on a range of environmental and societal relevant, socially relevant topics. This evening, they're working in partnership with the Scottish Storytelling Centre and the IUCN UK Peatland Programme. So this will be the sixth event in the Sage's Story uh, event series, and it's held in the run-up to COP26, so the United Nations Climate Change Conference being held in Glasgow at the end of the year. So these events are all about the excitement and the challenges of finding scientific solutions to climate change. The event series spans the globe from the Arctic to the Antarctic, trying to engage everyone with the work going on today. So if you'd like to find out more about future events, please sign up on the mailing link, um, which you can find in the, the chat throughout this session. So we're particularly excited about this event, which is something a wee bit different. So over the past couple of months, a range of very intrepid researchers have been working with a professional storyteller to learn how to turn their research and passion for peatlands into a range of science-inspired stories for families, something that's quite different from their day job. So this evening will be the first performance of five of these stories, each performed by the author. Thank you so much for joining us at this exciting premiere. So like all good stories, I'd like to start at the beginning and share a little background as to why peatlands were the inspiration for our storytellers this evening. So for some of us, every day is bog day. For others, bog day comes around just once a year on the fourth Sunday in July, which is today. And it's an opportunity to explore and celebrate the brilliance of bogs, fens, swamps and marshes, which are all different types of peatlands. So covering 10% of the UK land area, from the Exmoor Myers in the south to the Flow Country in the north, and from the Great Fen in the east to Snowdonia and Quilker in the west, a wide range of wetland habitats have their foundations in peat. And while we often think of peatlands as remote, wild places, they're also an important feature of some of the UK's best known and most visited green spaces. So our national parks, nature reserves, walking routes and wildlife watching hotspots, all providing space for nature and ourselves and our doorstep and supporting much of our rarest and most threatened biodiversity. Below the surface, peatlands are powerhouses of carbon storage, storing a third of the world's soil carbon, yet covering just 3% of the planet's land surface. And peatlands present some of the most immediately achievable actions in the fight to reach net zero and dampen down the effects of climate change. And as if existing as a natural part of nature's jigsaw, providing homes for wildlife, places for us to work, live and play, and helping us to fight and adapt to climate change isn't enough, they can also help to protect us from flooding and wildfires, provide us with drinking water, teach us about the past from the information buried below their surface, and so much more. There is little substitute for standing on a peatland and finding out for yourself what makes it special. But advances in science and virtual reality technology are helping to bring these sensitive and often remote places indoors 
So they can be explored and monitored from classrooms, offices and armchairs. So helping to change the perception of unknown, desolate landscapes into more familiar, appreciated habitats. So within that, with that in mind, let's get to the part you've all been waiting for, the stories themselves. And our first storyteller this evening is Professor Roxanne Anderson from the University of Highlands and Islands. So Roxanne's a peatland scientist originally from Quebec in Canada, who fell in love with bogs 18 years ago. Her passion took her to the far north of Scotland, where she's lucky enough to live and work in the flow country, the largest blanket bog in Europe and a candidate for the UNESCO World Heritage Site. So Roxanne's research has covered topics from microbes to plants, from molecules to landscapes, from carbon cycling to bog breathing. And she loves nothing more than to share her fascination with this amazing ecosystem. So if you're sitting comfortably, then let's begin. Thank you very much, Sarah. Um, so today I would like to introduce you to the story that I thought about and wrote particularly for my daughter Clara. Um, Clara loves bugs, she loves plants and she loves dragons so I thought I'd try to get some of my research into a story that I could tell Clara that would bring about some interesting, um, some interesting elements. The story is called The Special Blanket. Here we go. In the north of Scotland, 10,000 years ago, the glacier retreated, scouring the land mass below. Soon after, plant spirits woke, yawned and stretched, gazing at the landscape the ice age had etched. A young birch tree spirit, who was the tallest, suddenly jumped with panic and unrest. Oh no, oh dear, he cried, Sandy alarm. And he pointed in the distance with his thin woody arm. Calm down said a shrub spirit. What's the problem? The dragons, cried the birch. Can you not see them? So they all looked around and they saw with horror. Dragons everywhere in a very deep slumber. I know what to do, a small voice whispered quietly. It came from a bog moss, small, crimson red and dainty. We'll knit a blanket, she began, but they all laughed and said, fool, a special blanket, she said more firmly, that keeps dragon cool. It'll need to be big for all the dragons to fit. So let's start, she went on and taught them how to knit. And thus all the plant spirits sat down and knitted. They knitted and knitted and knitted and knitted. For thousands of years, they knitted tirelessly. And the blanket, the blanket grew from the mountains to the sea. The blanket grew wide and the blanket grew deep. It rose up and fell down as dragons breathed in their sleep. Until one day humans arrived in Scotland to build homes, to hunt food and set claim on the land. They poked at the blanket, making holes here and there, and the plant spirit sensed the change in the air. They gathered a council to review the situation and discussed and agreed on a course of action. See how the rips are mostly on the edge, argued a golden and slender looking sedge. They won't wake the dragons, I'm pretty sure. They're tiny cats. The blanket is secure. That's right, said the shrub. And can we not mend it? I suggest that we just continue to knit. So the plant spirits knitted and knitted some more, but while they knitted, they couldn't ignore that for reasons that they just couldn't get, humans continued to ruin their special blanket. The holes kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Look, the birch spirit scream, this human brought a digger. And the plant spirits all looked on with despair as the dozers and diggers cut out drains everywhere. Then humans brought flocks of very hungry sheep to graze near the gashes so long and so deep. They planted foreign trees around large ditches and stretched and broke down the blanket spikes ditches. Enough, 
the bug must shouted. Something must be done, or before we know it, the blanket will be gone. But who can we tell? Will those humans listen? Maybe not them, mused the sedge, but maybe their children? And so the blanket spirits overcame their fears to whisper like the wind in the children's small ears. Look closely at this blanket. Isn't it sublime? We have all knitted it for such a long time. See all the life that depends on this blanket, the rivers that it feeds and the birds that live on it. Look at all these colors, how they change in the light. And the children saw it all with a newfound delight. They tried to describe this beauty to others and managed to protect some of the blanket corners, but the damage was profound. The blanket was shrinking and the dragons deep down soon started stirring. I'm worried, the birch tree, tree said to all the plant spirits. The blanket is so broken it's fallen into bits. The dragon's breath have become erratic. If they wake up it would be dramatic. They must tell the truth. The wise bug must spoke. The world that we know may well end up in smoke. We must warn the children of the real dragon's threat. We must teach them to knit and to mend the blanket. It was their last chance. The plant spirits knew it well. So they summoned their powers in a magical spell. And as the children slept, they started to have visions of the broken blanket bursting out with dragons. In that way, the dreams truly began to reveal just why the blanket was such a big deal. The dragons were very scary, but there was hope too, as the dreams also showed the children what to do. The children spoke to everyone and told them the story. They warned of dragons and of the plant spirit worry, that if the blanket was not looked after fast, then even the humans were not guaranteed to last. So now humans block drains, cut trees and patch up cracks. And the plant spirits are able to follow in their tracks. They join forces and work as one team, stitching back the blanket with a yarn made of dream. And what of the dragons, you may be wondering? Under the mended blanket, it looks like they are snoring. And I hope they will continue to snore for another 10,000 years or perhaps even more. I hope you enjoyed my story. Thank you. What a wonderful story of bog spirits and dragons and mended blankets. That was fantastic. Thank you, Roxanne. So our next storyteller is Bethany Copsey. So Bethany was born uh, near the North York Moors, but is a relative newcomer to the beauty and wonder of peatlands. She discovered them at her action camp in Germany at the end of 2019 and has been fascinated with peatlands ever since. So originally from North Yorkshire and with Irish grandparents, Bethany treasures the way that peat brings her closer to family history. She's interested in the cultural and social aspects of peatlands and has a creative and experimental approach to them. She co-founded the collective Repeat, a fantastic youth-led initiative collective uh, that works to bring more awareness and appreciation to peatlands. Over to you, Bethany. Great, thanks, Sarah. Uh, so my story is called On Time. So, let me start by introducing myself. I have quite a fickle nature. I live in the spaces between, between land and water, between dead and alive. But I'm also quite particular. I live with a very unique set of friends. I'm known by, very, by many names. And you may know me as the bog. I've also lived for a very long time. I've seen many generations. I've seen the similarities and the differences, and I've seen the same issues and themes crop up in so many different ways. And people always seem to think that they're so different from the generation that came before them. But quite interesting, well, should I tell you a story? Recently, I made a new friend. Her name is Mary. She came visiting from out of town and came to the bog. Her family had lived in the area a few generations ago. Her great, great, great grandparents called me home and generations of the family before that. But her and her family now, they like to come and visit the bog and hear and see all of the, about the bog they've heard about in so many of the old family stories. 
Mary, she knew about bogs and peatlands. She'd heard them spoken about in conversations on climate change and biodiversity, topics that were very important to Mary. But she didn't know me as intimately as her forebears did. And well, Mary, she wanted to change this a little bit. So she went out walking over the expanse of peat, which is my body, I suppose. And for someone not acquainted or fully acquainted with peatlands, I am quite an unexpected beauty. But I also pose a danger. I shift forms with the water. I breathe, contracting and expanding. I extend for meters below your footsteps. And if you don't know your way, you can get lost. And on this day, my old friend, the fog, was setting in. The fog and the bog, the bog and the fog were very good friends. And Mary was beginning to feel disoriented. Which way did she come from? Which way must she now turn? And I don't mean to give people a fright in such a way. I am the bog I am, after all. I can little change my form. Only people can do that, like through draining. And that often has devastating effects on my health. But, well, that's another story. So I was thinking for a while, how can I help Mary? And at this point, I have to introduce Sheila, who's Mary's great, great, great grandmother. I said she called me home, but indeed she lived with me. We were very good friends. And her family was reliant on this area. Before such recent inventions like electricity, which you may think is a very recent invention, but when a very long invention rather, but when you've been around for as long as I have, it's just a speck of time. So think about then how this family kept warm. There were no modern houses with the appliances and heating options that we have today. The people in those days, they had to use the resources around them for warmth. And do you know what people in this area used then? Well, they used me, they used peat, and they dug the peat, they dug me. And this was arduous work, you understand. But it was also a wonderfully connected work for the community. The family would gather with the neighboring families and they would come together to cut the turf together. Bricks of peat would be stacked in various pile arrangements left out to dry. You may ask, by the way, whether these stacks still felt like a part of me, like, or whether they felt rather like fingernails or hair cuttings on the ground. And to be honest, I'm still figuring that one out. It did make me a touch uncomfortable, for sure, but for a long time, none of us realized the true effects. In those days, I felt untouchable. I was huge and deep and old, and these humans, well, they, they seemed so small and vulnerable. But I'm getting distracted. Back to Mary and Sheila. So I conjured Sheila up, such, as the, such are the skills of being a being who understands time so differently to all of you. So Sheila approached Mary slowly, of course it's quite a shock to see another being emerging from the peat and coming towards you. But Mary took it all in her stride. She's definitely one of my kin. Well, I thought Sheila could help Mary find her way in more ways than one. And a lot has changed since the days that Sheila was around, although she still spends most of her time here. I just had to remind her to take the routes possible for humans, none of the afterlife tricks and trials of rising and sinking and floating with the wind. And they started talking about me and their relationship to me. Mary recounted the indescribable feeling of coming home, even though she'd never been here before and frankly didn't feel entirely comfortable here. She spoke about the beauty and the wild expanses. But she, and she couldn't understand why anyone would want to do me harm, to dig and burn and drain. And Sheila told her that she used to dig the peat and they burnt it in her family's fireplace. She painted a picture for Mary. She recounted the homely smell of the peat fire, the warmth of the slow burning embers, the family gathered all around. It was quite a lovely image. Well, Mary didn't quite agree. She was mad. She poured questions at Sheila. Why would you do that? Don't you know the harm it causes? Why couldn't you find another way? Now, Sheila was quite a feisty character in her day, but it seems time has mellowed her out because she calmly answered Mary's questions. She told of the cold winters and the warmth that was offered by the peat, of the community cutting peat together and the social fabric that it formed for the community. In hindsight, it's a wonderful and a wonderfully destructive thing, I tend to think. Mary got a taste of that that day. You can't rewrite stories from the past, from where you never were, or armed with knowledge that you never had. She realized the importance of peat uh, in Sheila's day for survival of the community. But she also had a nagging feeling about the importance of peat in her day. So I've mentioned time a little bit and how I understand it quite differently. Uh, and that's a different story as well, but for now it's enough to say 
that I decided to conjure up Mary's great great granddaughter, which would be Sheila's great 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 granddaughter. And her name is, or will be, or is Zoe. Zoe told her ancestors about the peatlands that she knew and that existed in her day. Those that were restored by communities, the growing understanding that all forms of natural phenomena need to coexist on the earth and be companionship with one another. I thought it would be good for Mary and Sheila to talk a little bit with Zoe. For Mary, I thought it would be good for her to see that although she burnt and cut turf in her day, at times change in questions of survival and necessity, they take different forms. And now it's a question of being a good steward and protecting the peatland for all of their ancestors to continue to flourish. And for Mary, I think it's very crucial that she has hope, that she sees that there is a viable future here, but also that she knows how much work this requires. That there needs to be people like her who are fighting for me, fighting for peatlands. And I never told you exactly what happened to Mary. Well, with the help of Sheila and Zoe, she did find her way. And she went on to learn a lot about my cultural heritage. She visited me more often. She came to, be my, came to know my complex layered history. And she came to be a wonderful companion and steward. Now, I suppose I tell you all this story in order to inspire you to do the same, to become a steward of peatlands and a companion of peatlands and to other ecosystems and other beings as well. And for a being that's lived as long as I have, then this moment is, an, is a very crucial moment. Um, and we all have to fight for the, our fellow companions on the earth. Thanks. Thank you, Bethany. That was a wonderful story of history community survival and the timelessness of the fog and the bog and the bog and the fog. Love it. So our next storyteller this evening is Dr. Rebecca Arts. So Rebecca's a senior researcher at the James Hutton Institute. Rebecca's got more than 17 years of research experience in the ecology and ecosystem functions of peatland ecosystems and more than a decade of experience of providing links between science and policy delivering land management decision support tools, policy briefings and expert opinions on soils and climate change mitigation policy to Scottish and UK governments. Over to you, Rebecca. Hi, everyone. It's really nice to be here today. Um, like Roxanne, I'm not just a researcher, I'm also a mum. I have a six year old daughter who likes getting totally muddy at all times. And we sometimes go to some of our local bogs to just have a look for caterpillars and moths and lizards. And she just really likes being there because they're just lovely environments. So not only am I very lucky that I work in an environment that's so beautiful, I also get to enjoy it in my time off with my family. So this little poem, which I hope you'll enjoy, was kind of inspired by uh, trying to tell my daughter all about how we worked out as humans that we needed to look after our peatlands. Um, so this is a story about um, a little golden plover chick. So I hope you enjoy this and feel free to ask me any questions afterwards. So here goes. Once upon a time, there was a little chick she was a teenage golden plover and boy was she quick. Her favourite pastime was to swoop over the bogs and find the juiciest insects and peck at toads and frogs. Her name was Daisy and she had loads of friends. The water voles, the green shanks and even the village hens. But Lara Dunlin was her best female buddy. She was always up for getting totally muddy. Now the story goes that Daisy saved the planet, though she actually lived so far away from me that I heard it from a gannet. Now Daisy knew of a really clever trick because she had a gift like no other chick. She had the most impressive call that would make people sit up and listen and be nice and tall. Do you want to hear it? It goes like this. Want to try it? Just puck your lips like you're blowing a kiss. Anyway, I do digress. Let's go back to Daisy the chick and how she saved the planet with her clever trick. 
You see, one morning after she'd gone to plumber school, some people turned up with a big power tool. And soon they were digging big, long drains into the deep wet peat. You see, they were just doing it to grow more fruit to eat and to plant more trees. They thought they were doing a good thing, but they didn't realize how much trouble it would bring. Soon after, Daisy came home from school and she saw her mum cry. Their favorite bog pools had all gone dry and all around them, it all had changed. The lovely smelling bog myrtle had been exchanged. As far as the eye could see, everything was covered with some kind of Christmas tree. They looked kind of nice at first, but they grew ever so dense. They looked kind of foreboding. All the kids grew really tense. And then the Dunlin family decided to move. They said they'd come back if things would improve. But as the trees grew, the peat became too dry and it caused all their favourite plants and insects to die. Now Daisy was starting to get really quite sad when even the short-eared owls talked of leaving. She went proper mad. So what did she do? She flew up to the people and she just started tweeting. <whistles> Look here, can't you see the birds weeping? Oh, the people loved her sweet song and the funny faces she'd make. And by looking more closely, they soon realized they'd made a mistake. Half the birds were gone, the sweet smelling bog myrtle, most of the moss. Oh, what a disaster, what a terrible loss. So they came back to fix it and they brought a big tractor or a big tractor. And that was not all. Daisy had told them of yet another factor. Bogs are not just beautiful, they do this clever manoeuvre where they suck in carbon like a big giant hoover and then they hold onto it like a massive big magnet. That's what we call peat and Daisy told them it cools down our whole planet. So finally people said that they'd understood. All these drains and trees on our trees and our bogs, they're no good. So now we take off the trees and block the old drains. We cover bare peat, watch bogs get wet when it rains. And slowly, the birds and the plants are also returning and we do what we can to stop peat from burning. Now we all hope we repaired our bogs soon enough and in time so that many more kids can hear and remember this rhyme of when we all work together to cool down our planet. We call it net zero. So next time you're out on a bog, it's mad for our hero. <whistles> the golden plover called Daisy, who saved the bogs and our planet by tweeting like crazy. Anyway, that's it. So I hope you liked it and you enjoy all the rest of all the other stories for today. Thanks so much for listening. Thank you, Rebecca, and thank you for sharing the sweet song of Daisy and all her friends on the peatland. That's brilliant. So next up, we've got Dr. Laura Hepburn. So Laura joins us from the University of Stirling and is an oceanographer who's fascinated by the way that iron supports life on Earth and possibly beyond. So Laura's work takes her to anywhere and everywhere that we find iron, from drizzly Scottish peatlands to the surface of Mars and from the balmy seas of the equator to the inhospitable, storm-driven waters of the Southern Ocean, and in search of life as we don't know it yet. Over to Laura. Thank you for the introduction, Sarah, and welcome everyone. Um, this is uh, my story. Um, I hope you all enjoy it. The story of Little Fergus's big adventure. This is a story about how even the smallest of things can make a big difference. And Fergus the Iron Colloid was a very small thing. He was pretty much as small a thing as a thing could be. 
In fact, you could fit about 200 Ferguses alongside each other on the head of a pin. But Fergus was a very unhappy iron colloid. He didn't much like feeling small and unimportant. And there was something else as well. For as long as he could remember, Fergus had had a nagging feeling in the back of his mind that there was something he really should be doing. The problem was, he just could not work out what it was. And so, one day, he climbed to the top of the moss that grew in spongy clumps on top of the dark, damp, squelchy soil that made up his peatland home. He stared out across the beautiful landscape and he thought to himself, if only I could work out what it was I need to do. As he continued to daydream, Fergus began to hear a low grumbling noise, like the beginning of a thunderstorm. But looking up, he was amazed to see that it was a beautiful sky overhead. As the low grumbling noise got louder and louder, Fergus began to fell the ground beneath his feet, start to tremble and shake. And then with an almighty crunch and clang of metal on metal, Fergus the Iron Colloid was scooped up and catapulted into the air by the strong jaws of a huge and monstrous beast. Fergus was terrified. He only had seconds to think. He knew that very soon he was going to get gobbled up forever. And so he scrambled as quickly as he could to the very tip of one of the giant's massive teeth and he peered over the edge. Oh, it was a long way down and Fergus was only very small. And so closing his eyes really tightly so he couldn't see how far down it was and gathering up all of his strength and courage, he hurled himself out of the monster's gaping mouth and he fell towards the ground, twisting and tumbling through the air as he did so. Then with a splash, he landed in the cold, crisp waters of a wee burn that trickled its way through his peatland home. The burn carried him on further away from the monster and Fergus began to relax. But pretty soon, the trickling burn turned into a broad, meandering river that twisted and turned its way along the valley floor on its long and winding journey out into the open ocean. As it continued to do so, Fergus started to feel a bit strange. He started to notice a sharp tingling sensation on his tongue as the water got saltier and saltier. And then his stomach started to wobble and it made some very unhappy noises. He started to feel really quite poorly. And then as he looked down at himself, he found that he was losing whole chunks of his body. Oh no, he thought, I, I'm falling apart and I can't do that because I've still got a really important job to do. If only I could work out what it was. But Fergus didn't have any time to think about his really important job right now, because as the river was getting closer to the sea, it was becoming an estuary. And as it got saltier and saltier, Fergus shrank smaller and smaller and smaller. Then ahead of him in the distance, through the murky brown gloom of the estuary water, he saw a tiny black speck. For some reason that he couldn't quite explain, Fergus was drawn to this speck. He knew that if he could only reach it in time, everything would be okay. And so, even though he was tired from his terrifying ordeal with the monster, and then his long journey through the burn, and then the river, and now the estuary, he gathered up his last bit of strength and he 
paddled as fast as he could towards the little black speck. His little legs had never moved so fast as they propelled him through the rushing water. And just when his tiny little arms were about to fall off from sheer exhaustion, he saw that the little black speck was just ahead of him. He could almost touch it. Then a surge of water pushed him forwards straight into the little black speck and as he went tumbling past it he grabbed hold of it as tightly as his weary little arms could manage and he held it as closely as he possibly could. As he did so the little black speck let out a yelp of surprise. Oi! Who is that? What's going on? Fergus looked down and was amazed to see that it wasn't a little black speck after all. Hi, I'm Callum and I'm a carbon atom. Oh dear, you, you don't look very well at all. Are you okay? Oh, said Fergus, I'm so sorry I crashed into you. I was terrified as the river started to turn into an estuary and as it got saltier and saltier, I was falling apart. I didn't know what to do. I swam to you as fast as I could because I thought you might be able to help and make me feel better. Oh, said Callum. Well, did it work? How do you feel? Fergus thought about this and then he answered. Actually, Callum, I feel much better, thank you. Callum said, well, since I'm on my way to the sea anyway, why don't we continue our journey together? Fergus decided that this would be a terrific idea. He didn't much like feeling poorly. And so began the journey of Fergus the Iron Colloid and Callum the Carbon Atom out into the open ocean. Carried on the strong ocean currents, the two brave little particles passed other estuaries where rivers were merging into the ocean. And here they came across other iron colloids that looked just like Fergus. And each of these iron colloids was accompanied by a carbon atom that looked just like Callum. But their journey didn't stop there. From the estuaries, the ocean currents carried them into some of the chilliest, coldest parts of the ocean, where they saw sea ice melting and drip, drip, dripping iron colloids into the sea. The ocean currents carried them onwards and they passed hot, sweltering deserts, where the warm sandy winds blew even more iron colloids straight off of the land and into the sea. And then their journey carried them onwards way down into the deepest, darkest ocean depths. And here they found even more iron colloids bubbling up from hydrothermal vents that look like smoking underwater volcanoes. Surely one of these iron colloids must know what you're supposed to be doing, suggested Callum. And so Fergus asked each of the other iron colloids in turn. But they all replied, no, none of us know what we're supposed to be doing either. I'm sorry, we can't help. But we do know it is something that is very, very important. Just then, another ocean current swept up past them and it carried Fergus and Callum and all of the other iron colloids and all of the other carbon atoms into the surface of the ocean. When they arrived, Fergus and Callum could not believe what they saw. Floating in the water all around them were millions upon millions of tiny little sea plants. They were all different shapes and sizes. There were some round ones, there were curvy ones, there were even some spiky ones. There were some long thin ones and some twizzly spirally ones. There were even some squishy ones. There were some with tiny black holes and then there were others that looked like exploding fireworks. 
Fergus and Callum thought that they were all beautiful, but very quickly they realized that something was wrong. All of the little sea plants were buzzing around in a terrible frenzy. What's wrong? asked Fergus. One of the little sea plants wandered over to Fergus and Callum and it said, oh, oh, it's terrible, fretted the little sea plant. We're in such a panic. You see, we're all types of phytoplankton. We're like little sea factories and we take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and turn it into vital energy for lots of different creatures in the sea and some on land as well. And eventually the carbon dioxide that we take out of the atmosphere, we store away safely in the seabed. Wow, exclaimed Fergus. That does sound like a really important job. Oh, oh yes, yes it is, answered the phytoplankton. It's very important because if we let the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere build up and up, it will make the sea too warm and none of us will be able to live here anymore. And then we store it away safely in the seabed so that it can't get back up into the atmosphere anymore. And this keeps our home nice and safe. But the problem is that the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is building up quicker than we can deal with it. And what's worse, we've run out of one of the key ingredients that we need to run our factories. Oh dear, oh dear, said Callum, what is it that you need? The phytoplankton blinked sadly and with a low, slow sigh, he said, iron. In some parts of the open ocean, we just never seem to have enough. Well, Fergus could not believe it. After spending all that time in his peatland home, trying to work out what his job was, and then after traveling far and wide all over the world, he had finally found his purpose. And so, puffing up his tiny iron colloid chest with pride, he announced, I can help you, I'm an iron colloid. And not just me, all of my friends can help you too. They're all iron colloids. And so, with a little help from Callum, and with a little help from all of the other iron colloids and carbon atoms from the rivers and the estuaries and from the sea ice and from the hot sweltering deserts and the deep, deep ocean. Fergus got stuck into the role that he was born to play. All day long, he worked really, really hard churning carbon dioxide from the atmosphere into energy to feed lots of creatures throughout the sea and even some on land as well. And then he tucked it all away safely in the seabed to keep his home safe. At the end of the long, tiring working day, Fergus snuggled himself up in his bed sheets and as he watched the sun sink below the horizon and the first sleepy stars start to brighten up in the night sky, Fergus looked back on his big adventure and thought to himself, wow, who would have thought that someone as small as me could ever have such a big and important job to do? so far from home. And then, with a satisfied sigh and a long yawn, <laughs> Fergus the Iron Colloid drifted off to sleep, dreaming big and important dreams. The end. Thank you ever so much for listening to my story. I really hope you all enjoyed it. That was wonderful. Thank you, Laura, and for sharing the very important work of Fergus the Iron Colloid and his journey from the peatlands to the sea. Who knew? 
So last but not least this evening, um, we have our last uh, storyteller for today. We've got Professor Lorna Dawson from the James Hutton Institute. Lorna's a forensic soil scientist. She's registered expert with the National Crime Agency and has worked on over 100 forensic criminal cases in the UK and abroad. She has encountered Pete on many occasions, both as an important medium for delivery of fresh air, clean water, a haven for biodiversity, and a vast store of carbon, and also as a medium for disposal of weapons and bodies. Over to you, Lorna. Thank you, Sarah, and thank you all for coming along to listen to our different stories about the different role that Pete plays in all our lives. Well, one day, Pete would play a significant part in the lives of two children, Jesse and Danny. It was the school holidays. And their mum and dad said, let's go and visit great Granny McKee on the west coast of the island. So they got in the car and drove the short journey to see great Granny McKee. She was 95 today. What a wonderful celebration they would have. They took freshly baked cakes, some eggs from the hen, and a bunch of freshly grown flowers from their garden. So they all drove across the island, and here was great Granny McKee. She was sitting in her chair with the fire on, warmy, warm, toasting her toes. But her face was sad. Jessie and Danny went into the corner and played with the toys in the toy box. Their mum and dad were asking what was the matter. Great Granny McKee said, I'd just been to the doctor, 95, I know it's a good innings, but he says I don't have long to live. But I've had a good time, oh. I've had a good time, and like all things, it's the cycle of life. And for the young ones coming along, it's my time to pass. But I'm not sad about that, she said. I'm sad about great grandpa McKee. I want to know what happened to him. Several years ago, he'd been walking along to the local village post office and he never returned. At the time, the police came from the mainland, a big search team, they didn't find him. So poor great Granny McKee, she never really got over that. Danny and Jessie were listening to this. And as they drove home that night, they said, do you think we could help? Maybe we could find him. So their mum and dad said, oh yes, yes, we'll do that one day. But because it was the school holidays, they got onto their bikes and they cycled along the route, the route that he would have taken from the village shop back to his house, his cottage on the hill, on the edge of the peat bog. So the first day they walked, set out areas that they would look for, but no luck. They couldn't find anything. So the next day they thought, what can we do? And, and Danny said, what about my drone? We could take it and look and see if we could see bits of the land where maybe there were some clues. So they took it up over the back area, up over where they planted some Sitka spruce, up where there was some nice pond areas. The wonderful colours of the peatland, the reds, the greens, the yellows of the sphagnum, the bog cotton, the little bunches of white and, and the wonderful sundew, the lovely colours, but nothing unusual just natural, beautiful peatland vegetation. Then the next day they thought, well, Jessie said, why don't we take Minnie, our dog, with us? I've seen that on the TV programmes and the dogs sometimes help out. So they stuck Minnie in the basket on the front of the bike and off they went again to the little road that he would have walked. They stopped at a piece and they searched it and took Minnie and no luck. A second area which had some, some disturbance that they'd seen from, from the drone footage, but no, no luck. Then a third area which the photographs that the, the camera that was on the drone had shown that 
there was a bit of disturbance where the peat had got a little bit eroded and it was exposed some of the lower bits of that peat bog. So they set Minnie out there and all of a sudden Minnie went, woof, 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 really getting excited. And they got out and they looked and they said, wait a minute, that's a bit of a tartan bonnet. What? How great Grandpa Mickey always wore a tartan bonnet. So they quickly got on their bikes, they put down a large stone so they could know where they, many had seen this piece of tartan. And they cycled to the local village and here PC Campbell was in the police station. And he said, okay, okay, I will call the mainland and they'll come out and they'll look tomorrow. So all the whole team came over again and went to the area that Danny and Jessie and Minnie the dog had identified. With careful reconstruction, the forensic archaeologist, the forensic soil science, the forensic pathologist were all there and the police team. And they very carefully recovered the bonnet. And sadly, that was great grandpa McKee's bonnet. And very sadly, that was great grandpa McKee in that peat bog. But the pathologist showed that he'd suddenly had a heart attack as he'd walked home. But they took him and they reunited him with great grandma McKee. But PC Campbell said to Jesse and Danny here, look what we found clutched in his hand, still protected, preserved after all these years in that cold, wet peat, still in its envelope. So they took that card to Great Granny McKee. She opened it and it looked as if it was on the day that he'd bought it in the local shop. Happy anniversary to my dear wife. With a tear in her eye, she put that up on the mantelpiece. And a smile came across her face. They'd been reunited. And sadly, Great Granny McKee passed away the following day. So when Jessie and Danny went back to visit her cottage when she was no longer alive, there was no burning flames in the fire. Her, her tartan rug was over the arm of the armchair. The card was on the mantelpiece, but they looked out through the window, away off in the distance, and through the window which looked out over the peat bogs, they were sure they could see two shadows walking hand in hand off into the distance, smiles on their faces as they walked across the precious peat bogs that had revealed the tale and reunited them many years after. Thank you. Thank you, Lorna. And what a way to finish this evening's event. I'd like to say a huge thank you to all the authors this evening. We've had a question come in for the Q&A, so we've got a few minutes um, that we can, can ask questions of our authors. And so we've had a question in from Tamsin saying that she's loving all of these stories and offering thanks for the kind of different uh, approach to a webinar. So a question for the speakers, and I think we'll take this in, in order of, of the speaker's appearance. So how hard did you find converting your research to a story? So what was the biggest challenge and what was your favorite part of creating your stories? So if I put that one out to Roxanne first. Hi, thank you. That, that's a wonderful question. I think for me, the hardest part was probably tonight's performance, actually, uh, because this is really out of the comfort zone. I think that, you know, normally the kind of presentation that we do is very much, you know, in a certain format with scientific detail and rigor and things like that. So having the kind of creativity behind it was a bit more difficult. I didn't find writing the story or thinking about the story very difficult because this is something I really enjoy doing, making up stories for my daughter, talking about 
you know, talking about peatlands and peat bogs in, in slightly different terms for my daughter. I find it kind of more easy, but yeah, definitely for me, the performance and the preparation for the, perform the performance was perhaps the most difficult. Great, thanks Roxanne. Bethany, would you like anything you'd like to add to that? I would say a little bit the same about the performance, I suppose. It's always like a little bit more intimidating when it's like a little bit more personal, I suppose, or something that you write. But mine is also not hugely based on like research that I'm doing, more kind of like a family connection or something like this. Um, so. Brilliant, thanks, Bethany. Rebecca? Yeah, I'm probably similar. Um, I chose not to talk about my active research, but kind of more about um, how the research I do has come about as a, as a result of a change of um, people's perception about peatlands. And that's been that's been kind of um, an interesting story to tell. And so I, I found it maybe a little bit easier because I didn't try to make a direct link to what I do on a day to day basis. But definitely the, the very um, unusual format and yeah, using a, a way to express or um, or share a story in a way that we not, don't normally do. I'm very much more comfortable with the, the written um, word than I am with live webinars. So, but thank you. Thank you very much for the question. Great. So, Flora, anything you'd like to, to add? Um, thank you, Tamsin. What a great question. Um, I suppose in, in some respects, um, a lot of my story was kind of already written there because there's the tale of the, the burn on beginning its long journey as it goes out towards the open ocean. So that's kind of already a story in itself. Um, I think one of the most challenging um, aspects of it was trying to um, give personality to a tiny speck of iron that we currently don't even have the technology to really even be able to see or, or do anything. So I thoroughly loved um, drawing that out mentally in my head and also on paper as well. Um, and I, I, I love the challenge of it. It was very good. Um, but I think if you've ever seen anyone that's ever seen me um, talk before knows that many of my science presentations are equally animated. And I, I find I enjoy giving an aspect of storytelling to my research because I don't feel as a scientist that there is any point in doing my research if I can't tell it to people and if I can't deliver it to people that wouldn't have access to it. Um, so a platform like this is absolutely wonderful. It's really great to show us scientists as creative individuals because um, what is science after all, if not a way to bring up new solutions to um, problems that we're facing? So thank you, Tamsin. What a wonderful question. Thanks, Laura. And I'm sure everyone would join me in agreeing that all of all of yourselves as authors have done a wonderful job of being amazingly creative and inspiring and, and animated. So really enjoyed enjoyed all of your performances. Lorna, is there anything else you'd like to, to add to Tamsin's question or, or, or in response to Tamsin's question? One of the most, thanks Taz, Tamsin for that question. One of the most interesting things and, 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 and on reflection um, about engagement and different ways of engaging with people and storytelling is a fantastic way to do it because it allows people to come into the subject to really feel they're living with it. And, and I think that's been very important. My topic one of um, death was, was very personal in that I lost my mother uh, during COVID. And that was hard to deal with for my children and, and my grandchildren to cope with death. And, and I think it mirrors um, how we look at um, the circle of life and, and how peat, its longevity is something that we should celebrate. Um, we should, like we should celebrate our, our people that have lived before us and how we are just part of a long line of history. So we should celebrate um, life and death and celebrate the wonderful nature of peat and the mysteries uh, of what we don't know just as much as what we do know. That's brilliant. So I think building on very, very quickly, just to wrap up, so building on, on what Laura's just said, 
I think it'd be great if um, we can do a quick, very quick round robin of what as authors, if you could have one kind of hope of what people hearing your story take away from your story, what, what would it be? So what, what would you like people hearing your story to take away from it? Um, very, very quickly. So Roxanne, should we go with you again? Um, I think I think if if people can take away from all the stories tonight that there's maybe something magical about bogs, then then I'd be quite happy. And if they believe that there's dragons underneath it, then all the better. Brilliant, Bethany. Um, I think for me, something about tradition. So I think maybe the tradition is really important, but actually, why we have those traditions is the most important thing. So we don't just keep doing the same thing. But we think about why we did that thing and then maybe do something different, but that, that's still a tradition, I suppose. I don't fully know how to say it, but something along those lines. That was well said. Well said and understood. Uh, Rebecca, I think, was next. Yeah, I, I guess my wish would be that people would remember that peatlands are really amazing and quite unusual places with um, different flora and fauna to most other places on this planet and that they are the world's biggest carbon sink and also the world's most um, prolific hoover of carbon dioxide and like Daisy if we all make more of a noise then perhaps the rest of the planet will start to listen and it can just be part of what we do to make our planet livable for the next generation and generations after that. So that would be my hope. Thanks Rebecca. Laura? I think my message would be that peatlands are one part of a very connected um, environment um, and they have a massive impact that spreads far and wide beyond their actual location. So when we think of peatlands, they're not isolated bogs. They are um, amazing environments that are connected from uh, rainy Scottish peatlands to the, the deepest oceans. Um, so I think that is something to take away. Fantastic. And Lorna? Like we uh, should care for each other, our family and our friends, but we are but specks in a long history of time. Peat has to be also cared for, as it takes a long, long time to build it up and create that wonderful, wonderful thing that peat is. But it takes a very short time to destroy it. It does. I would echo, echo that thought. And what a thought to finish on. Um, so I'd like to extend a huge thanks to everybody that's joined us this evening um, and obviously a, a, a huge thanks to all of the authors. So to Rebecca, um, Roxanne, Bethany, Laura and Lorna for sharing their wonderful stories of peatland inspired by their work as, as scientists. Um, I'd also like to extend a big thanks to Alette and the Scottish Storytelling Centre for helping our authors create their masterpieces and to Hannah Grist for organising uh, this event and bringing it all together. I really hope you enjoyed all the bog tales. Um, so all of this evening's stories will be released individually um, and together as a creation throughout the coming week. Um, and that will be released through Sages. Um, there's also a wee reminder to sign up if you wish to the mailing list for Sages for future events. And that can be found in the chat. Um, and future um, ongoing, oh sorry, uh, ongoing event from March as Sages story event, um, which was a competition called Waterfall in Motion. Um, we'd like to invite people to submit videos of how they use, monitor or protect their local water resources with a range of exciting prizes available. Um, so more detail on that link is also in the chat. So last but not least, um, there is a reminder for the next event, which will take place in August, which will highlight the work of early career researchers. Um, if you'd like to learn more, have a sign up to the mailing list and keep an eye on the Sages website. And with that, that just leaves me to wish you all a very good evening and good night. Thank you. <laughs>